Good morning, Sadhguru. Thank you for taking time to talk to me. I you were just telling me just now your travel schedule, which is kind of hectic. So I'm, I'm glad to have a moment to sit down with you today. Um, the people listening are people all over the world who are interested in the fashion industry. <laughs> uh, the people watching might also not know everything about you, but I just... I never intended, but uh, <laughs> you know, uh, people are thinking I, I just designed my own clothes and now people are saying it's a big fashion statement. So it could be. I mean, it, it is beautiful. <laughs> just by natural choice. But I, I, I wanted to start the conversation by, for those people who aren't familiar with you and your work and your story, if you could just introduce us a little bit to you know, who you are and how you've ended up um, becoming <laughs> the person you are and, you know, what, what is it that drives you? Oh, I'm not driven by anything. Okay. <laughs> I'm self-driven, <laughs> not driven by anything. Uh, not used to talking about myself because I never thought there's nothing much to say. <laughs> um, but people who want to understand what, what you do, like how do you explain it to someone? Well, there are many areas of work. So people are always trying to define themselves by what they do. Right. This is what I'm trying to change in the world. What you do should not define who you are. Who you are should define what you do. Right. So. Who I am is really nothing, so I do whatever is needed. Right. <laughs> so that got me involved in variety of things. Mm -hmm. One thing is fundamental human well-being. So systems for human well-being which we developed come under the brand of, uh, is, you know, inner engineering. Then ecological needs are there, so we started what is called as Project Green Hands. We planted over thirty-three million trees, so please, people started calling me a tree planter. Then I said, I'm not a tree planter, my basic work is to make human beings blossom. <laughs> then the rivers in India was bad, so we started Rally for Rivers, which became the largest ecological movement on the planet. One hundred and sixty-two million people participated in a month-long uh, event. And uh, this has become a recommended policy in India for all the states, the central government recommended the Rally for Rivers policy recommendation document we gave. The United Nations also took it up and we launched what is called as uh, a decade of action in UN. Well, we are involved in education. Uh, it's not that I'm interested in all these things, I'm just interested in life. Whatever, wherever I see things are not functioning well, inevitably I get involved. So education, health, nourishment, ecology <laughs> and now fashion uh, because the way we dress is destroying the world. Textile has become the third largest polluter on the planet. Right. So one important thing that needs to happen is to shift back to natural fiber as much as possible in the coming few decades. Right. If we don't do that, uh, because everybody is shooting the plastic bag which is visible. The lowly plastic bag is, yes it needs to be handled, but it is not the main thing, it's just visible and flying all over the place. But textile or polyfiber is one of the biggest polluters when it comes to plastic pollution, it's the largest one actually. Mm -hmm. But it goes unaddressed because uh, it is all microfiber. It's in your body, it's in the food that we eat, it's in the water that we drink, it's everywhere. So shifting back to natural fiber as much as possible is an important thing and this is also… this… this will also handle variety of other aspects for nations which grow natural fiber and have the capacity and the talent to produce uh, yarn and then to weave it in many different ways which is a skill that human beings developed for over thousands of years. You know, it took millennia to develop these skills, but we're just killing it just in one or two generations, simply because we got machine-made cloth and we got uh, synthetic fiber. So, overall well-being of the human being involves clothing also, so here I am. Right, and it's New York Fashion Week. 
-hmm. It might not be evident from where we are right now, but what, what, is, what is your goal with the, the event that you're holding this week in New York with we have, all of these designers? We have brought in about 120 distinct weaves from India. So we want to expose this material to the designers here and to the, those who consume fashion products. The important thing is to move them towards natural fiber, that is a basic element both for health and ecological purposes. There's substantial studies which show that wearing synthetic fiber causes immense damage to the system and could be the source of various diseases that we are suffering, unexplained uh, levels of cancer, many things. Some people say it is still not very well established, but definitely it has impact. They are saying almost there is not a single American citizen who doesn't have a certain amount of plastic in their bodies. This may be so everywhere, probably only Americans have been studied, they've been put under the microscope. They say on an average twenty-eight grams of plastic could be in an uh, American citizen's uh, body, both from food consumption and textiles that they use, especially for children. The level of skin allergies and other things you're finding is mainly because of the type of uh, clothing they're using. And once you use synthetic clothing, it is very flammable, so to make it not so flammable, they're using other kinds of chemicals which are carcinogenic, there's no question about that. So these things need to be reversed now because as it is, it is estimated we are on an average, every human being on the planet has five times more clothing than what our grandparents had. That sound number even sounds low to me. That's among your clients. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but when I see people's on, closets On now, an average, yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. But by 2025, they said that's going to double. That means yeah. we'll have ten times more. So when this kind of phenomenal increase in textile consumption is on the threshold, I think it's very important we bring back natural fiber. Okay. So these four designers that you're working with this week, you know, they all come from different disciplines in fashion. There's, you know, Sabya Sachi from India, and then there's Norma Kamali and Mara Hoffman and others from here. How, what is your expectation with how these textiles from India will be used here in a different context? The uh, big names in America have to take up natural fiber as a cause, and uh, it is both Ecologically and health-wise, it's going to be a big step for American people, especially those who can <coughs> afford, no matter what is the cost they're buying. So, for those who can afford, my intent is to push it in such a way that the designers themselves push it in such a way that right now the Wills, uh, you know, the, the Wills lifestyle clothing in India went hundred percent natural. Yesterday or day before, there was a full-page ad in uh, Times of India and I congratulated them and they responded. So major companies are going, Raymond's in India is going almost mostly natural these days. So in America it needs to happen because what happens in America naturally cascades into the rest of the world. For whatever uh, reasons America has become or attained to a certain kind of leadership, uh, though fashion is supposed to be centered in uh, Paris, what happens in America, everybody does. Everybody is tearing their pants these days because, <laughs> you know, it happened in America. So I feel American designers are very important in this process, that we recommend at least fifty percent of the well-to-do should turn to natural fiber. This will also create a market. As I said, there are one hundred and thirty-six distinct weaves in India. These must survive means there must be a market also. This is not about whether it's Indian or not Indian, that's not the point. These are skills which evolved over millennia. We're just killing them, just like that, not understanding what is involved in making these things. Yeah, I mean, speaking of the Indian textile industry, um, there's been a lot of um, threats to the survival of textile crafts and um, the, the tradition of creating these textiles, which you know, many of them have been passed down from generation to generation. Can you, can you educate us a little bit on what's 
you know, the history of textiles in India, why they're so important, why they're integral to the culture of, of India and expression of the creative, creative side of people. See, if you look back a few thousand years ago, nobody on the planet dressed like Indians with the finest possible cloth. When clothing in rest of the world was very gross and coarse kind of clothing, in India we produ produced the finest kind of clothing. Well, I'm talking about looking at the… because uh, in India we don't uh, record history by factual facts and accounts and numbers and things like that. But if you look at the stories, if you go back to a story like Mahabharat, almost six thousand years ago, they're talking about Pithambar, a silk cloth which is very fine and which has certain, uh, you know, in terms of its color and its vibrance, it's of a certain kind. Six thousand years ago, they were wearing those kind of clothes. Mm -hmm. So if you go back into the Indian folk history, you will see enormous talk about what kind of clothing. Well, we know three hundred years ago, we were the largest textile exporting country in the world. Eighty-five percent of the world's exports in textiles was India. Between 1800 and 1860, systematically, uh, Her Majesty's, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, <laughs> works systematically destroyed textile industry. Well, this is not uh, to create bitterness, but this is a fact of it, history that somebody took advantage of it and they developed their industry and they destroyed another nation's industry. And because of this, people went into farming to survive because it is believed that there's no records of how many Indians die usually. Between 1800 and 1860, it is believed about 1.5 to 1.7 million textile weavers died out of starvation and lack of… Uh, because textile export dropped by 98 percent in 60 years. Wow. And its value dropped by 6,300 percent in 60 years' time. So people lost their livelihoods and that's when everybody moved into agriculture. When the British left in 1947, over 90 percent of Indians were in agriculture. Not all of them are farmers, most of them were weavers and related industry who all went into farming just to survive, to scratch the earth and have something to eat. Subsistence farming became a big part of Indian uh, survival. It is only now they're again moving out into other various other activities. And even today, in the last ten years, over three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide because they're all growing only food from their old practice of growing food for their own survival. Our intent is at least thirty percent of the farmers or farmland should go into natural fiber. Back into textiles. Yes, because they're only growing perishable items and uh, there is no market system where perishable, I item, perishable items will be preserved and he will get the right kind of price. If he has a bad crop, he has a bad crop and he dies out of that. If he has a good crop, the prices will crash in the market and he'll die out of that. This is the way the economy is going all the time. Sure. So shifting a percentage of land into natural fiber will be a big step in that direction. Even today, over four million uh, families are involved in textiles. Out of these 136 weaves that I'm talking about, ne nearly 67 of them are almost extinct. Yes. Just one family, one old man keeping it alive, his children have already become software engineers <laughs> They are somewhere else in the world. Yeah. And just this one more person dies in the next ten, fifteen years time, that form of weaving will just die. How distinct it is means, there is a place, this is… because you're a fashion person, you must visit these places, they're unique. There's a place called Gulled Gudda, that means <laughs> in meaning it's a Kannada word, it means that uh, a hill that ran away. A hill that ran away. Yes, because way back, we don't know when, what dates, a whole village lived on the hill. For some reason, maybe they ran out of water, I don't know what happened. They all moved to the plains. 
So in that one village, they have a distinct way of making only blouse pieces, you know, the Indian sari blouse. Of course. They make only that particular thing, it is made only in that particular village in the entire country. Wow. <laughs> it is… that blouse piece only they make, they can't make it any longer, they are trained only to do that. And that has a market in a certain sort of people. But all these things are disappearing because no designer to tell them, okay, you can make some other kind of the same weave, you can make it into a dress material or you can make it into something else because the number of people wearing saris has dropped dramatically in the last ten years. It's, it's almost disappearing except in southern India, in the north you hardly see anybody in saris. So, the market is disappearing and naturally the talent will disappear. These are things that we must be proud of because how many ways human beings learn to do things with their hands is incredible. Right. So what will it take, Sadhguru, to get, you know, this thirty percent target that you've set to shift people back into the natural creation? A live market, a demanding live market. Okay, tell me more about that. <laughs> so that's why we're in America, because on an average, an American person dumps about twenty-eight kilograms of clothing every year. In India, the average is about one… one point five kilograms of clothing is dumped. In America, it's twenty-eight kilograms per person is dumped into the dump. So the highest consumption of clothing is happening here. This is where the real market is. And above all, this is kind of a… a showroom market. What happens here will naturally happen in the rest of the world. In that context, creating a market in America is very important for natural fiber. That message is one One that, important thing yeah. that we could do yeah. from people like you is, we must promote this, at least in school uniforms, children must wear only natural fiber. We can produce a whole lot of medical documents, research to show what kind of impact it'll have on the child's life, mind, development, neurological system, learning disabilities, how just natural fiber will have impact on the child's growth. So this, uh, we are looking at how to, you know, collate all the medical information that is there and present to the private schools to start with or go to the state schools and see if one one state can go. Right now, Kerala in India has gone for all government school uniforms are cotton. Now I am pitching with the central government to push for this. Now it's election time. This time it may not happen but by next academic year, we are looking at least three to four states in India must go that uh, government schools where millions of children study, their uniforms should become uh, natural fiber, whatever it is in that region. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful point. The challenge here in America is that not all of the, you know, kids in school wear uniforms and people have been talking about messages of sustainability and, you know, natural fibers for many years. And there still seems to be some blockers getting in the way of getting that to register in the minds of the people when they make a purchasing decision. Schools can make this decision because every human being may not make the decision. If a school makes a decision, children must all come with natural fiber, whatever they choose, cotton, silk, linen, whatever mm -hmm. they want, jute or whatever. Right. So if they make the decision, whether they're wearing a fixed uniform or whatever they wear, the most important thing is, we must move away from this sense of clothing must be all starched like a knife and, uh, you know, must be pointing this way, we are not in some army or something. It's all right to wear something little crumply, mm -hmm. you know. Actually, the most affluent people are wearing very crumply and torn clothes again. Mm. This is true. <laughs> um, the other interesting connection to Indian textiles happens to be a timely one because this, this is the 150th yes. anniversary of the birth of That Gandhi. is why we call this fashion for peace. Okay, so tell I'm me about I'm part of the 20-member 20, 20 committee chaired by the Prime Minister for this. So as a part of this, we are doing three major focus of activity. One thing is we are doing big movements with the farmers. So, we are setting up large-scale uh, farmer-producer organizations, bringing scale to India's farming. 
India's farming, the biggest problem is lack of scale because the average land ownership is one hectare, which is 2.5, 2.25 acres. With that scale, the investment that goes in it, there's no way he's going to make it. So the important thing is integration, not of land, but of input in terms of uh, irrigation and marketing. These two things we want to integrate through what is called as a farmer producer organizations. For which work is going on, we're setting up a few model villages and this work is going on because uh, that was very dear to Mahatma Gandhi, the village life that sh should be sustainable and economically dignified for uh, the rural population. The next thing is uh, textile because when you think of Mahatma Gandhi, you're always thinking of a, a, a oh, spinning well, wheel, yeah. <laughs> charaka it's called. So we are into textiles, this is called Save the Weave project and uh, right now it is being in America, it is named as uh, Fashion for Peace, but in India it goes by the same umbrella brand, Save the Weave. Many things are being done. We are identifying all those uh, type of weaves which are dying which are sure to die in the next ten to twenty years' time because there's only one family usually keeping it up. We are seeing how to put young people who are interested in learning and propagating that and taking, a, taking it up as a business. For all this, market is important. That's why one focus is here and in India we're doing various other things for the same. The third thing is, uh, there is no culture of peace in the world in the sense Whenever there is a war or conflict, we have conflict resolutions, but we have not focused on developing a culture of peace. There are communities in the world who have developed a culture of peace among themselves, that they have found ways… See, in every transaction there could be conflict. This is the nature of trans human transactions. But if you evolve a culture of peace within yourself, in your community, in your nation, among nations, then there is a way of resolving these problems and these potential conflicts uh, in a peaceful manner. So, we are looking at conversations with, uh, uh, you know, like uh, celebrities who will turn everybody's heads in the world, those kind of celebrities. One we will do either in New York or uh, Washington, another in London, one in Berlin and one in Moscow, and then we are closing with Porbandar. We are establishing a… That's where Gandhi was born, Porbandar. Yeah. We wanted to put this in Porbandar, but now they asked us to move to Ahmedabad. So Ahmedabad where Sabarmati ashram is, where Mahatma Gandhi's ashram is, if you… overlooking that, if you look from there, down… down below is the riverfront of Sabarmati river. So at that place where from the ashram you can see it, every day there are thousands of visitors to Mahatma Gandhi's ashram, they can see a twelve-foot tall bust put on a four… Uh, four-foot high platform designed in a certain way. As you know, we built this Adiyogi statue in a unique way. So this is being already made in our center. Mm -hmm. So we will do that on 2nd of October, which is Mahatma Gandhi's uh, birth anniversary. I wanted to conclude the conversation. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you a bit of advice because, you know, there's millions of people around the world who seek your counsel on navigating life and um, the vicissitudes of life, as some people call them. You know, earlier we were, I was talking to you about, um, you know, what once one person called or told me or, or described to me as an epidemic of stress in the world. You know, and, you know, in our industry, in the fashion industry, but as you pointed out, in every industry everywhere, you know, people are stressed. You know, wh where, where do you think this epidemic of stress <laughs> comes from and how can… how can people eradicate stress? So stress is uh, not because of a situation in which we exist. Stress is because of a situation that we do not know how to manage our body, our mind, our emotions and our energies. Because uh, essentially because you have a very complex machine here. If you want to look at human mechanism, it is the most sophisticated machine on the planet. Though everybody is too enamored with their iPads and iPhones and whatever other phones they're using, they're calling them smartphones. You call somebody smart only when you find them smarter than you, isn't it? Hello? 
Isn't that the normal? I, yeah, you I can you say, say that. oh, this is a very smart guy. Why? Because you found him smarter than you. Okay. So the phone has become smarter than you <laughs> in some way, because at least it seems to know what it is doing. <laughs> Most human beings don't know what the hell to do with themselves. <laughs> Because uh, they're going at a very sophisticated machine without even reading the user's manual, <laughs> to put it simply. <laughs> they so haven't paid attention to how this one works. Simply they want to conquer the world. They are a mess, but they want to conquer the world. See, when you yourself are an issue, how will you handle any issue? Tell me. If fashion is stressful, well, politics must be horrible. Running an automobile industry must be worse. Spirituality must be terrible because all the time you're meeting these people. <laughs> right. <laughs> the problem is only you don't know how to manage yourself, isn't it? So this inability to manage yourself has come because we want to manage everything except ourselves. Before you touch something, you must be in a good condition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you're really interested, before I touch you, I must be clean, isn't it? Yeah. People, uh, if they're handling their little infants or something, they wash their hands clean and everything and handle why? Because they understand what I love, before I touch it, this must be clean <laughs> So before you touch the world, this must be clean. Now when you are in a stressful condition, you are saying because of a certain industry or a job or whatever, Somebody comes to me, he's uh, heading a multinational company, a global leader. He's in a terrible condition. He comes and says, Sadhguru, I can't take this anymore. The kind of pressure they're putting on me, it's just killing me. I look at him and say, may you be fired. He <laughs> says, <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, Sadhguru, what are you doing? I said, hey, you're <coughs> suffering your job so much. If you get fired, at least you can walk the beach. Yeah. And I'm sure somebody else is ready to take this damn job. I'm sure a hundred people are waiting to take your job. A lot of people would kill to have his job, I know <laughs> But you're suffering it so much. Why for you? Either you fix yourself or you get out of that place, isn't it? Tell me, what is it that is not stressful for human beings? If they're poor, they suffer, their, they're stressed about their poverty. If they become rich, they're stressed about the taxes. They're not educated, they're stressed. Ask the children to go to school, how much stress? <laughs> not married, they're stressed, get them married. Also stressed. <laughs> so, if you're out of your business, if you're out of your family, if you're out of all activity, will you live joyfully and fantastic? No, if you're alone, you'll be stressed to the core, isn't it? So the problem is not with your activity. The problem is the fundamental mechanism has not even been a… something so complex, no attention has been paid. So the entire process of inner engineering is just this, that you understand how this mechanism works. Once you know how it works, you know how to deal with it. Your body, your mind, if you… if you, see people are fifty, sixty years of age, they've still not figured how to handle their thought and emotion. When are they going to do it? Do they have a million-year lifespan? I don't know. By the time you're fifteen, sixteen, at least you should have figured it out. But at sixty, you still don't know how to handle your thought and emotion. When will you figure it? <laughs> right. You know, you once, you once said, um, life around you will never happen the way you want it, and it should not. What did you mean by that? Because if everything, everything happens your way, where do I go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's not happening your way. Right. Little bit your way, little bit my way, little bit somebody else's way. This is how the world should happen. If it happens all your way, or even if you want it all your way, you're a tyrant. It'll never happen though, fortunately. Mm. Even for the worst tyrants, it did not happen, isn't it? Right. <laughs> fortunately. Fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for taking time to chat with me. That was very illuminating. I, there was a lot to learn about, you know, the textile industry and sustainability and also a bit of advice to help manage ourselves. You must, you must develop the market for natural fibers. This is not just about fashion, 
this is going to make millions of people's lives.